everybody. How you doing? It's Montel Williams here again with another edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. And my guest today holds multiple degrees, one in clinical nutrition, one in chiropractic medicine, a medical degree, an MBA in healthcare management. And in 2018, he became a diplomat of the American Academy of Cannabinoid Medicine. He's a published author of multiple articles for medical journals, as well as a best-selling book, Hope and Healing, A Case for Cannabis. He's the co-owner of Coastal Cannabis Clinics and the co-medical director for Minorities for Medical Marijuana. Please welcome Dr. Joseph Rosado. Dr. Joseph Rosado, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you very much for having me, Montel. It's a great, great pleasure and honor to be speaking with you today. Oh my goodness, sir. I mean, I think what we ought to do is let's start with giving some people some of your background, where you started. You started off in the medical industry at age 16. And I say that, and I hope everybody will, what did he say? Age 16. Why don't you take us back and take us on this journey, where you, how you got here today? Sure. Thank you very much for, for that uh, segue. I, um, I've always been interested in medicine, even as a child. My father was an x-ray technician in uh, New York City at, at Sloan Kettering Hospital. And um, when I was bored, I would go through his anatomy books and I would go through his x-ray positioning books. And so as a result of that, I got very, very involved in medicine. Um, so when the opportunity presented itself, my dad passed away when I was 11. My mom was a single mom and was um, you know, supporting, was putting me in a private school and I wanted to support my tuition. So I didn't want to do minimal labor job because back then, you know, we're talking 1978, minimum wage was like, you know, three, four bucks. And it's like, you know, this isn't going to, help me in any way shape or form and so at the school that i was attending they offered a an orderly course and i signed up i took the course and at that time i had to be 16 to be able to work so i took the course at 15 when i turned 16 the following semester because my birthday is in june boom i was able to start working and i started working as an uh an orderly in an assisted living facility in central florida and then from there, I transferred to Florida Hospital uh, as a transportation orderly. Then I went on, became an EMT, then an EMT paramedic. Well, you became an EMT at age 18. Yes, sir. At age 18. At age 18. At, wow. I became an EMT, then a paramedic, because again, I had to wait for the, for the age requirements. But as you can see, I've always been progressing, you know, from orderly, EMT, EMT, paramedic, paramedic, cath lab technician. Then I was involved in a severe automobile accident that caused a compression fracture in my spine. Oh. I was in pre-med at the local university, University of Central Florida, and uh, I sustained that injury. And I went to a chiropractor who I had been to before for a sports injury. And within two, three weeks, I was feeling much better than I did before because as a result of the compression fracture, it caused severe neuropathy, nerve pain, something that you experience with your MS. And, you know, I'm at the height of my, you know, martial arts career. I'm training in the state of Florida. I'm competing pretty aggressively. And now I, I'm not able to walk without having pain. I'm like, what the hell is going on? So I go to this chiropractor who was amazing and uh, uh, sorry, I'm getting a little emotional because, you know, it's one of those life changing experiences. Sure. And so um, at that time, I decided to go to chiropractic school instead of medical school. I went to uh, Marietta, Georgia, got my degree in chiropractic medicine, got my bachelor's degree in clinical nutrition and went on to work as a chiropractor. Everything was going great. Uh, moved to Ohio, from Ohio, moved to Arizona in late 1994, build a practice from scratch. Within two months, I'm seeing 100 patients a week, you know, just building up my practice on social media, no, not social media, on the radio station and the printed media, et cetera. And um, 1996, my twin daughters are born. In 19, late 1996, I get a call on a Sunday, not a call, a, a page. Those of you that had beepers yeah. back in the day, my beeper, <laughs> with a phone number and 911. So I call the number and, you know, I identify myself and it's the father of one of my patients. And, say, and I'm like, hey, Ruben, what, why are you calling me? 
And he's like, oh, Doc, I'm glad you answered the phone. I'm sorry I'm bothering you on a Sunday, but it's our daughter, Annie. I'm like, okay, what's wrong with Annie? It's like, well, she's got a very high fever. And as a result of that high fever, I'm concerned that she's going to have a febrile seizure because that's what she had when she was a baby. And I'm like, well, you know, why are you calling me and not your pediatrician? I'm a chiropractor. I, I can't help you with this. And he said, but you are our doctor. I'm like, well, wait a minute. You don't have a primary care pediatrician? No. I'm like, but I'm seeing you because of your car accident. You know, it's like, yeah, but you're our only doctor. I'm like, well, why don't you just take her to the emergency room? And he's like, but because we're illegals. And as illegals, I'm afraid that if I go into the emergency room, they're going to deport me. I'm like, oh, man. So I'm like, look, what I'm going to tell you is as a friend, not as your chiropractor, because if I tell, by telling you this, I'm giving you medical advice and I can, I can be stupid. I can lose my license to practice. So I went back to my EMT days, you know, told them about a tepid bath and, you know, Tylenol, no aspirin to avoid Rye syndrome, et cetera. And then uh, I said, look, I, I'm, I'm going to get in my car. Give me your address. I'll drive over there now. And, um, you know, if, she's out of alignment or whatever, I'll adjust her. And I also did Reiki, you know, I could do some Reiki on her and see if we could work energetically on her. But, you know, if she has a seizure, you're gonna have to dial 911. So he's like, okay, no problem. So I take off, get to his house. As I'm pulling into his street, I see an ambulance. And I'm like, crap, it happened. So I pull up to the house, the wife, the mom, is waiting at the front and she's like, you know, she had a seizure, but I'm waiting for you. And I'm like, okay, hop in, we'll go. So I get there, I didn't identify who I was, just a family friend translating. And so I'm in there translating um, and this little girl's in a full blown grandma seizure, but in status epilepticus, nothing is breaking, nothing is breaking. And they're giving her, you know, IVs, medication through her IVs and, you know, suppositories and intrarectal medication and, and nothing, nothing, nothing is working. And I'm like, it's like, something's got, you know, they got to do something. I mean, something's got to happen. And then shortly thereafter, she came out of, out of it, was post dictal but she had lost bowel, bladder function, just, you know, a nine-year-old girl in just a really, really bad situation. Anyway, um, when it was all said and done and, and I, you know, left and, you know, everybody, you know, the kiss and hug, traditional Hispanics, I got in my car and I began to cry because I couldn't help her. And it frustrated me that here was a patient and I couldn't do anything for them. And they needed a doctor. And although I was a doctor, but I wasn't a doctor that was able to help them with their needs. And I, I vowed that day that I would never be in a situation that I couldn't help somebody. And so the following day I went online, well, not online, Yellow Pages. <laughs> You're so used to saying online. I went, I went to Yellow Pages. Um, called a few prep schools for to take my MCAT. And uh, I took my MCATs, I interviewed, and um, this was 96, 90, yeah, 97, 96, 97. And um, I religiously watched your show because my hours were from two to eight at the office. And in Arizona, because of the two hour time difference from the East Coast, I was able to catch you before I went into the office. And you used to have a guest by the name of Sylvia Brown. Certainly. I called her, set up an appointment, and had a consultation with her and told her, look, I'm in this situation. This is what my plan is. This is what I'm doing. Can you help me? Because I'm seriously going to be going 180 degrees from what I'm doing. And philosophically, a lot of the things in medicine I may not agree with, but I need this degree to be able to do what I want to do. And uh, she was very kind, very, very gentle with me and, you know, helped me come to the realization of what I needed to do. And I went to medical school. Now, at the time I had twin daughters and, you know, they were a year and a half. Um, so going to medical school in the U.S. was extremely expensive. Couldn't maintain a family before. So I called a cousin of mine who's a physician in Spain. And she said, you need to do what I do what I did, go to, to the Dominican Republic, get your medical degree. And then once you get your degree, you take your boards and the world is your oyster. And that's exactly what I did. I went to medical school, um, 
received student loans because I'm a US citizen. I was able to receive student loans. The school was recognized and I took my boards and then um, pretty much the rest was history, continued on, um, it evolved. And then in 2014, when John Morgan was promoting the use of, of medical cannabis, at that time, I sent them an email and said, you know, John, I'm a physician, I'm an advocate, how do I get involved? And the following day, his campaign manager reached out to me. I spoke with him. He spent the first 15 minutes talking me out of it because so many physicians in the past had said, I want to get involved. But then hospital privileges were then revoked or, you know, suspended. Um, partners were saying, look, if you're going to do this, you can't be part of our group. And I said, look, you don't have to worry about it. I'm committed to doing this. So how do I get involved? And so a week later, I'm on the Bureau of Speakers and I get my first interview and I'm freaking out because it's not legal in the state of Florida. You know, we're promoting something that for years had been promoted as the world's, you know, plan, the world's weed. It's atrocious. It's the gateway drug. All this stuff is going through my head and I'm freaking out. Like, why are they going to listen to me? And then... I went back in my brain to a book I read in 1996 entitled Mountain, Get Out of My Way. <laughs> that, that portion in the book where you described that you were in your whites and you were going to go in and speak, I believe, to a group of high school students and your this same conversation was going on in your head and you're like, you know, what do I have to say that's of importance? Well, that got me through it and I moved on and I was able to begin my, my trek in speaking and then I got better and better at it. I educated myself more and more. I reached out to doctors that were doing it already. Started reading everything that Rafael Meshulam uh, printed and wrote, Lumir Hanouj, Ethan Rousseau, and just got more and more knowledgeable. And then uh, once it became legal and we had medication, I was the first in the state of Florida to recommend medical cannabis to an adult female in the North Central Florida area of stage three brain tumor. She is still alive teaching yoga on the beach, doing phenomenally well. Um, so I was the first in the greater Central Florida area. And then three months later, I was the first in the state of Florida to recommend to a pediatric patient, a 16, a 15 year old that had a stage four rhabdomyosarcoma, head and neck tumor that Although he passed in February of the following year, the quality of life that he received with the plant was spectacular because he was getting 16 milligrams of morphine pumped into him through a morphine pump every hour. And he was a zombie. He laid on his hospital bed, drooling, looking at his crotch. And all of a sudden, Within a month, we cut the dose down from 16 to eight, and now he's able to eat and he's able to swallow and he's able to get out of his hospital bed and be with his family in the kitchen and in the living room and dance with his sister and be the best man at his brother's wedding. So yeah, he only lived until February the following year, but those months from November to February gave him a quality of life that that morphine was not giving him. Absolutely. I mean, now, you know, you did the, you, you covered a lot right there and, you know, it was slowed down for a second and back up because, you know, one of the things that you really truly did was research, 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 and understand what it is you were recommending to your patients. And, you know, I wonder, Doc, even where, where we are right now, we're in the middle of this COVID crisis and it almost seems in some ways, some people are kind of going backwards when it comes to cannabis again, rather than going forward. I've heard people say, well, you know, yeah, how can you be talking about something you're going to smoke during a respiratory uh, uh, virus going around? I was saying, well, stop, you don't have to smoke this. You know, the benefits are coming from the cannabinoids and they don't necessarily have to be ingested through a smoke. You know, you can vaporous form. And in some ways, if you look back at the, you know, the 2000 study that Bill Clinton had commissioned, in, uh, I think it was in San Diego, University of San Diego, he and McCaffrey commissioned a study trying to refute the benefits of medical marijuana. Their study came out saying that they were seeing that there was some form of some weird neuroprotection against lung cancer from those who had smoked. 
So I'm thinking to myself, my goodness, hold on a minute. If we're going to have a conversation about that, and we had this conversation now 20 years ago, now 20 years later, we're dealing with a respiratory infection that could possibly be helped by the cannabinoid neuroprotection ability of cannabis. Why do you think that all of a sudden, it just seems in the last couple of months though, I'm, just, I'm getting this vibe from people that they're reverting back pre-COVID or pre-COVID when it comes to cannabis? Well, fortunately, uh, uh, many states, and I believe all, if I'm not, uh, I, don't quote me on this, but I know for certain in the state of Florida, the dispensaries were considered an essential business. Absolutely. Done so. And I, mean, I think almost every state that there is a medical cannabis program has considered uh, the dispensaries as being essential services. And that being said, the state of Florida relaxed its stronghold on being able to follow up with patients because the, the law, Senate Bill 8A, reads that you when you do a recommendation or a follow visit and you're making a recommendation, it has to be face to face in the same room. But because of the situation, they issued an emergency order allowing for us to be able to do our follow up visits virtually, which has supported our patients and our dispensaries were already delivering to the homes. So the patients didn't even have to leave their home. The dispensary was then delivering the medication directly to their home. So it was to their advantage. Now, as with everything, you know, I, I, as a physician, I, that's the first question I get hit with. Well, how are your patients getting their medication? If, you know, it's, it, you know, they, they, can, they can't smoke because if they smoke or they vape, it's going to cause a problem. And to which I immediately respond, well, the FDA published an article stating that they had no sufficient data to state that smoking, or I'm sorry, that vaping weakened the lungs or made you predisposed to the COVID-19. So the fact that you're vaping is irrelevant because as you just so well stated, the cannabinoids work on the CB1, CB2 receptors that are found in the lungs. And the absorption that takes place, you know, CBD is a phenomenal anti-inflammatory and antioxidant. So it's going to ward off any diseases or inflammation that's going on in the lungs. And it helps prevent emphysema and asthma treatments because of the anti-inflammatory antioxidant effects that it has. So that's why research has shown that when you smoke cannabis or, in, or vape cannabis, there's no possibility of getting lung cancer. There are other things that you can develop like cough, phlegm, bronchitis because of the excess phlegm production. But as far as cancer or weakening the lungs, absolutely not. I use- And we may, we may find with more research now, part of that phlegm and part of that, that cough may be coming from some of the byproduct, the fats and the lipids that are included in theirs. But when you're using isolates and you're using that in a way and reformulating with isolates and you're using that in a way, and again, we've got to find a better medium than I think um, medium chain you know, triglycerides. But the second we do find a medium that we can actually suspend it in, we may find that the CBG, CBD, CB, you know, D, D, CBV, all those things that, you know, again, we've now hit a point where what? I think a recent Canadian literature says that there's well over 160 cannabinoids and we're still trying to figure out how many there really are. Exactly. And as you mentioned, you know, CBG is five times as strong as CBD as an anti-inflammatory. Research has shown that THC is 20 times as powerful as aspirin as an anti-inflammatory and twice as strong as hydrocortisone as an anti-inflammatory. So, you know, it's not only the CBD and the CBG, it's also the THC that, you know, in, in my culture, everyone wants to say, oh, CBD good, THC bad. And I'm like, no, 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 it's got to be together. It's, it's a symbiotic relationship. I've been beating people over the head now for months. I mean, it's really very interesting. Is you know, I think you, you know a little bit, my, you know, most of my background, but I mean, I, I literally came to cannabis back in 2001 and back in 2001, I was seeking out CBD high strain cannabis back then, but knew that that wasn't the end all. Because the bottom line is that there has to be, and the way Raphael uh, uh, identified it to begin with, it is uh, working in an orchestra effect or a you know a, a concert effect, so that you need to have them all working together. They're there for a reason. Now we have to just determine 
which ones need to be planned a little stronger than the other. I like to use orchestra instead of entourage, but because an orchestra, when you take a look at an orchestra, you can play Tchaikovsky, but if you don't have a drum section, it's not Tchaikovsky. You know what I'm saying? It's music. It may sound a little bit like it, but it's not Tchaikovsky. You know, you listen to Beethoven. Beethoven was very heavy in the strings. Well, you need a, and piano. So you need to have, you know, and a piano is a string instrument, or a, you know, some people think it's a strike instrument, but it's a string instrument because it's got strings inside. And with the piano or with, with, uh, with that, you need to have a, a bigger orchestra effect with a larger little portion of the strings. So if you think of cannabinoids the same way, you want to have them all together, but you want to have just a little bit more CBD, or you might want to have a little bit more CBG on top of that. And you want to make sure you have a little bit of THCA on top of that. And, you know, especially, especially in your edibles and your edibles and, and things that you're going to ingest, because, you know, unless you heated up that THCA, you really wouldn't get the, you know, euphoric effect. But, you know, it seems like other than people like yourself, the industry has come to a standstill when it comes to trying to educate the consumer and getting that information into their heads. What do you exactly. think about that? And it's, you know, it, it's, it's sad that people that are supposed to protect us, that take a vow to protect us, i.e. our governors, our politicians that are there to defend us and protect our rights are in taking our rights away to utilize a medication that is is a benefit and of help. I, I remember in an interview you had done, I call which radio, which um, TV personality you were being interviewed by, but you indicated that on a daily basis you broke the law because the state that you lived in was not medical, but the state that you got your medication was medical, and you crossed the state borders on a daily basis, and you were breaking the law on a daily basis. And here you are, a decorated, you know, veteran. And, and you're breaking the law. I'm like, you, you fought for these rights. You fought for our freedom. And yet you didn't have the freedom to get your medicine. And still the day. I mean, you take a look at it. We got, what, 37 states in the District of Columbia that have medical marijuana or have some sort of cannabis law, but you still have 13 that don't. So in those 13, there are some pretty severe penalties for the use of cannabis in those 13 states. It's just really ridiculous. I mean, the fact that the VA has the nerve to say that they won't take away the benefits of a, of a soldier who lives in a state that has a medical marijuana program if they're a part of that program. But if you don't live in that state, they'll take away your benefits. Stop. How stupid and ridiculous can we be? And then you have countries. Last year, I, I was privileged, once my book was published, to be invited to eight different countries. One of them was, you know, were Malaysia, you know, Fiji. These are countries that have very, very strict laws on cannabis and the, the ministries of health and the, um, the attorney generals are reaching out and inviting people. You know, when I spoke in Fiji, I didn't speak to healthcare professionals. I spoke to 500 attorneys on the use of cannabis. And when I got done, the uh, district deputy director pulled me off to the side who managed all of the, you know, like public defendants, et cetera. And, and he's like, you know, uh, I got a story to tell you. I'm like, what's that? He said, you know, a week ago, we arrested an individual that got caught with X amount of marijuana. And he got 18 years in prison. I'm like, all right. And then I was getting ready to respond. And he said, no, no, wait, the story doesn't end there. I'm like, okay. He said, that same week, an individual raped a minor was a pedophile that individual got 15 years in prison and i looked at him and i said and how's that working for your country and he said after listening to you today it's not working in my country that's so that's so insane well, look at you know doc i gotta take a little break so if you're listening everybody tuned in you're tuned in to let's be blunt with montel and today's guest is dr joseph rosado and I'm telling you, you do not want to miss us when we come back because we have so much more to cover. I'm going to take a little break, pay some bills, and we'll be back right after this. Hey, guys, thanks so much for tuning in to today's episode of Let's Be Blunt with Montel, where our guest today holds multiple degrees. He's a clin clinical nutritionist. He's a chiropractic medicine provider. He's also got a medical degree. He's got his MBA in healthcare management. And he also is a diplomat for the American Academy of Cannabinoid Medicine. He's also published a book. It's called Hope and Healing, A Case for Cannabis. And he's also the co-owner of the Coastal Cannabis Clinics 
and co-medical direct director for minorities in minorities for medical marijuana. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Joseph Rosado, for being a part of Let's Be Blunt today. It's an honor to be here, sir. Thank you again. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit. Let's talk. Let's start off. Let's talk a little bit about Florida's. Well, first off, you know, we're, we're recording this today. And uh, today, uh, Florida just jumped, I think, had its highest number of positive COVID cases, you know, well over, I think, 11,000 today. And, you know, over the weekend, right? Well, I think it was like uh, 10,000 on Friday, 11,000 on Saturday, 11,000 on Sunday. This is really insane. And, you know, it is the big elephant in the room. So let's take a minute and talk about this. But where do you think we're going when it comes to this thing, man? I mean, do, do you think this is going to, will Americans wake up enough to understand that we do have some control over this spread? Well, unfortunately, the country did not manage the situation correctly from the outset. And those of us in certain states have noticed that our governors have not responded appropriately either. They're not listening to the physicians. They're not listening to the people that have experienced this beforehand. You know, I'm a very small fish in a big pond when it comes to the world. There's 6 billion people. I'm just one guy. But because of all of the traveling I did last year, I created sufficient connections in every one of these countries that I was in that I picked up the phone and through WhatsApp, through WeChat, I was reaching out to these people saying, you know, physicians saying, what are you guys doing? How are you doing? How are you dealing with this? What's happening? They were already telling me of what they were doing. I put myself in a quarantine before it was mandated to be under quarantine in the state of Florida because I already knew it was coming. That's me. I, I, I don't have the power to speak with all the world leaders in one you know, Zoom conference and talk to everybody and say, hey, what are you guys doing? You know, I watched on Netflix this hospital in, uh, in New York, Lenox Hill Hospital, where the physicians, once the pandemic hit, reached out to doctors in Wuhan and were having conversations with these doctors. Why couldn't our politicians do the same freaking thing? But no, let's reinvent the wheel. We're so arrogant. We know it all. Yeah, I, I still, even to the day, we're so arrogant, we won't even bother to listen to the experts. We don't, we act like we know it all. And, and we act like, I, I, you heard the, the blatant lies that came out this weekend in a couple of speeches about the fact that 99.9% .9 of people don't even have any symptoms. I, it's just, it's, it's ridiculous that we as Americans who used to be the leaders of the world are now literally the trail blazers at the end of the trail it's sad it's very sad and so you know i'm managing our patients you know virtually uh you know i am encouraging you know high doses of cbd high doses of cbg these are the things i'm doing myself i'm encouraging high you know high doses of vitamin a vitamin c vitamin e vitamin d to supplement to replenish because we're not able to leave our homes especially you know my family members in the Northeast, you know, because all this stuff started in March where it was still winter in, you know, New York, New, Ye New Jersey, Connecticut. So I'm reaching out to them saying, look, you know, this is what I'm doing. This is what you need to be doing. You know, reached out to some of my uh, contacts in, in uh, India. They gave me some herbs that they're using over there. Reached out to some friends in Mexico. What are you guys doing? And just creating this, you know, alphabet soup of remedies to keep myself healthy to keep my immune system up. But, you know, cannabis is forefront in, in my treatment, in my therapy. Absolutely. I'm, I, I am staying steeped in, you know, making sure I'm taking extra CBD every single day. And, you know, until I, I get a better, better uh, line on some CBG products, I haven't been able to add or additional, but I think, you know, the, the cannabis that I actually consume has a decent amount of CBG in it. And we know again, you know, that's, that's going to hopefully once this, this crisis ends and we can get back to doing what we were doing before the crisis. And I was, I was in the process of getting ready to bring on a different manufacturing partner for my own product in line that I have out. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and hopefully we'll have a new relationship and being able to produce a product that I think is going to be one of the better products in the marketplace. Because I, let me tell you something, five years ago, I was talking about increasing the amount of CBG in 
all distillate. I was trying to tell people, look, you know, if you go after a distillate and you make it, you go ahead and extract the THC and extract the CBD, well then let's start seeing if we can break down and just extract some of those other cannabinoids. Then once we have them all, you can go back and put it back together again. And when you put it back together again, instead of, you know, having, a, a you know, most of our smokable, you know, cannabis out there right now is probably somewhere around a 0.02, 0.04% CBG. Why don't we raise that up to a 1%? Why don't we add additional CBG to the product? You can do that easily just by adding a little bit of the distillate to your structure. Raise up so that percentage is higher as you ingest. Also with the, the whole plant or the flower, um, if you control the temperature setting because CBGA decarboxylates to CBG at 55 degrees Celsius. So if you have a handheld vaporizer where you could control the temperature setting, you could set the temperature at a lower set and that will afford you the opportunity to be able to get the CBG by setting it at a lower temperature because HCA and CBDA, as you already know, I'm preaching to the choir here, you know, decarboxylates at 220 Fahrenheit, which is about, you know, 112, 120 uh, Celsius. So by setting it at a lower temperature, which is what I encourage our patients to do so they can get it through their lungs and be able to, you know, work on that anti-inflammatory component and antioxidant, lowering the temperature a little bit on these products. So that way they are able to utilize as much as they can of the acids as well as the CBG. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, let's talk a little bit about, you know, now again, talk about Florida and what's been going on here in Florida. Do you think that number one, a full blown adult use campaign will pass here? Um. Not with the governor we've got now, although the governor we have now has done much more for our industry than the previous governor that we had. You know, Rick Scott was completely against, you know, smokable and he blocked Amendment 8 from truly being Amendment 8. And they created this bastardized Senate Bill 8A where originally they, there was no smokable, no flour being sold. And then in March of 19, when they added Senate Bill 182, and allowed for the smokable, that was done, you know, to thanks to Governor DeSantis. However, right now, I think his vision is not in the cannabis industry per se. He's got way too many other problems happening right now. Um, and we pretty much screwed ourselves. There were so many groups vying for adult recreational use that in order for the enough signatures to be obtained, we kind of shot each other in the foot because I would go to events and someone would be at a table say, hey doc, did you sign our petition? And I'm like, what petition is that? And they're like, oh, for adult recreational use. I'm like, well, which one? You know, which group are you with? And the individual was unable to answer. So if I, you know, I took the time to read it, but most people were like, oh no, I already signed for that. And so it, it com we completely screwed ourselves by all of the infighting that goes on between X group, Y group, Z group. Right, okay. But now do you think it has a chance in the next two years to pass? I believe 2022, but more, more so 2024, because 2022, we discovered in, in 2014, we lost by one point, you know, two, 1.8 percentage points. We needed 60%, we got 58 point something, because it was a midterm election when the presidential election rolled around in, in 2018, that's when we got the resounding 71%. So I believe that if we get ourselves together, unify ourselves properly, I believe 2024 would be the year for the adult recreational use, just because more people are gonna come out for that election than 2022, assuming we'll win this year. Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, and when you when we say and use the term adult use, you know, I think that's almost like a misnomer because I think anybody who gravitates to cannabis is gravitating to cannabis for an underlying medical reason anyway. I mean, I, I, it's contrary to gravitating towards alcohol, let's say. Right. And we know that the use of cannabis helps lower the need for people to drink alcohol because patients of mine in the past that were drinking a bottle of bourbon to put themselves to sleep and numb their pain are no longer using that, they're using their nine pound hammer and their granddaddy purple. So right. 
So, yeah, well, you know, I also know that in places like Israel, you know, cannabis is a geriatric drug, um, and people are utilizing it because they understand that they actually turn away from pharmaceuticals or, or, or prescription medication, and their prescription medication usage goes down as their cannabis usage goes up. So, you know, there, there is hope. Um, you know, it's not perfect, and, and I tell this to everybody, you know, our system, our program is not perfect, but having traveled to countries and other states where they have no program, at least we got some. And our, and our parents aren't having to leave the state of Florida to travel to Colorado like they used to do to be able to get their, their children's medicine, kids with Dravet's, Levinx, Gasteau, that were having two to 300 seizures a day. Well, let's tell us a little bit about Minorities for Medical Marijuana. What is that? That is a group that was started right around the time this whole program began in, in Florida, 2014, 2015, um, to speak on and discuss diversity and equity. Because you know, in the state of Florida, all the licenses that were issued, one of the licenses was supposed to be issued to the Black Farmers Association. We're still waiting for that license to be issued. Yeah, all the licenses went out initially, right, to Rick Scott's buddies. And so as a result of that, you know, um, our president, CEO, founder, Roz McCarthy, was the one that was instrumental in starting this process. And I had already known some of the people in the organization. And um, in 2017, early 2017, the Department of Health, right before, right after Amendment 2 passed and right before Senate Bill 8A was signed, which was uh, November 16 to June 23rd of 2017. And I know that date because my birthday is June 24th. It's not that I'm a day geek, but <laughs> it was Rick Scott's present to me. But, uh, but the Department of Health was having this dog and pony show going all over the state of Florida because back then we had a rule, a 90 day rule that patients had to wait 90 days before they could get a recommendation for medical cannabis from their medical cannabis physician. And I had more than 20 patients pass away waiting for those famous 90 days. And so while at that meeting, um, I was sitting with Roz and um, Eric Range, who are the top you know, two dogs in in my nurse for medical marijuana. And I had already been doing some interviews on their behalf, et cetera. And so I leaned over to Roz and say, hey, Roz, can I be your medical director? And she's like, hell yeah. And so that was it. And so as a result of that, now we've got chapters throughout different states in the United States, as well as internationally, promoting and speaking on you know, the equity. So the equity within this industry, which has been dominated by old white men. Well, you know, now, what do you think is the most important, you know, I don't know, tenet that we need to actually emphasize more on in moving this, this, this industry forward? Is it research? Is it regulation? Or is it education? A little bit of all, but education. Medical schools still don't teach about the endocannabinoid system. So there's, there's a few now starting to pop up, I understand. Just a few, but not all. Yeah, less than 10%. You know, 10% of the medical schools in the United States are taught the endocannabinoid system. So if a, if a patient walks into a doctor's office and says, tell me about cannabis, I read, you know, Dr. Rosado's book, Hope and Healing the Case for Cannabis, and I read about the endocannabinoid system, and I read, you know, the form was written by Lumir Hanush, who named the first endocannabinoid, anandamide, and they go to their primary care physician or their neurologist, and they're gonna look at them like they got three heads and they're like, that, that shit doesn't work. They don't even say crap. They come out and say, that shit doesn't work. There's no use for that. There's no studies, there's no research. Well, yeah, there's no research in the state of Florida. There's no research in the United States, but why, why don't you do some real research? And you know, thanks to Sue Sisley, who did some research with some veterans with PTSD in Arizona, as well as other universities that are opening up their minds, University of Puerto Rico, I uh, did a partnership with uh, Greenflower Media to do some uh, continuing medical education programs to be able to, you know, educate the physicians and have them get credit for their education. So 
it's happening, but it starts at the basic level, educating, educating the physicians, because in the medical program, we are the gatekeepers. And if we say no, patients are going to end up to doing one of two things. They're not going to use the medicine that they need, or they're going to go to the black market. Absolutely. When you talk about education, I think there's there's an important aspect that, is, that I've said since day one, since this industry started actually taking off back in 2011, 12, 13, you know, is that the majority of the people who got in this industry decided to, you know, do B2B education. And you're right, then doctor to doctor education, but, you know, people stopped and forgot that what's going to drive this the most is going to be the consumer. You know, the patient, the patient's the well, you just said, he's going to walk in and ask the question. Well, you know, if you educated the patient, he would argue with that doctor, no, butthead, you need to do a little bit more research. Remember the fact that the United States government has spent hundreds of millions of dollars on research that is out there now published that we can read. And there's a patent, a federal patent on the use of cannabis. Since but- 2001. <laughs> exactly. 19 years ago. You know, and, and still physicians have the audacity to say, there's no research, there's no science. It's, it's, it's a phase. It's, it's a fad. It, you know, I'm always, I'm always one of the first to say, uh, you know, all you have to do is read the abstract to the government's application for a patent. And it tells you what our government truly believes. And in that abstract, the government goes on for three paragraphs talking about the fact that this is probably one of the best anti-inflammatories that they've ever come across. It works for a very myriad of illnesses. It outlines the entire thing right there. So if the government out of one side of his mouth says it doesn't work, then why did it issue itself a patent saying that it does work? Because once somebody's buddy deschedules it, then Big Pharma is going to make billions of dollars off of it. Correct. And Big Pharma, you know, is already working as hard as they possibly can to do what they can to see if they can get cultivars in, see if they can work with people in this industry. You know, Big Pharma has been sneaking around this now for the last five years. So we just, you and I just got to keep doing what we're doing, which is pounding the pavement, educating the, the consumer, educating the physicians, educating, you know, our families and, you know, People that five years ago were nowhere near the point of accepting or understanding this are now texting me, calling me, asking me. So, you know, that's in five years. You've been at this a hell of a lot longer than I have, and we've got a ways to go. Absolutely. We do have a ways to go. Well, let's take a few minutes. Uh, if, uh, if, you, if you know of, you know, I'm always a, an info junkie. What is anything new you've heard about lately uh, when it comes to cannabis? I know about a month and a half ago, well, no, it was a month before this whole pandemic hit us. I had read some research um, talking about, uh, I read an article talking about the fact that they, I think it was out of Jamaica. Uh, some doctors down there had determined that they were seeing a significant um, impact of cannabinoids when it came to things like pancreatic cancer. Have you heard about that? Yes, I've had some patients with pancreatic cancer that are in remission right now. Um, another uh, study or information that they're doing is, again, searching new phytocannabinoids. Uh, they discovered in Italy, some researchers, phytocannabinoids that were 30 times more potent than THC and are being explored for medicinal purposes. Um, Rafael Mishulam is... The last time I heard him speak, I believe it was in California that I heard him, he was discussing the utilization of the acid form more so than the active form of the phytocannabinoid because there's greater um, attachment or linking of the acid form in the endocannabinoid system as compared to the active form. And so he was moving in the direction of targeting more the acids and not so much the actives. Yes, I, mean, I, I know I, I heard about that and I was, you know, I'm really excited about the fact that, again, even utilizing a lot of THCA in uh, tinctures and in edibles would be a much more uh, a faster way to absorb, right? Right. And a lot of uh, our pediatric patients that, you know, when their children are having breakthroughs or whatever, moms have found that by adding THCA, if they have better control of the seizures and the frequency of seizures than they do with the CBD by itself or the CBD THC combinations. So 
again, it, it's a rabbit hole. And like they said in the movie, you know, what the bleep do we know? You know, how deep down the rabbit hole you, do you want to go? This is one of those rabbit holes that the deeper you go, the more you learn and the more you discover. Well, now, now during this pandemic, though, you know, I know there were there were companies before the pandemic. There was a lot of money and a lot of emphasis on research. But is that same amount of research still going on now? Or do you think it's been it's been stymied by the pandemic? Well, some research has continued on. In fact, in Israel, there are some researchers utilizing phytocannabinoids in the hospitals, people that are COVID positive, and they're treating these individuals with cannabis and a, a special type of a, a specific type of a steroid and seeing how the people that are on uh, steroids and the conventional treatment are doing in comparison with those that are using CBD, THC, and you know the same treatment, but just the addition of phytocannabinoids. And they're doing a, a, compa- a, a comparative study of that. I did read that a few weeks ago. I, I was on um, Steve D'Angelo's podcast. And in there, uh, Dr. Knox uh, brought that up. And we discussed that, you know, quite extensively as to what is being done in Israel, checking and a study was done also in Canada, but that study was a little questionable. The one in Israel, they're actually, you know, implementing and just uh, watching what's happening with the incorporation of CBD THC to the present treatment. Wow. Well, okay. If you had a crystal ball, what do you think it's going to look like here in the next year, next two years, next three, next five? All right. Uh, let's start from the from the furthest and move back. In the next five, I believe um, federally, it, it's going to be it's going to be legal at, at the federal level. In the next five years. In the next five years, I, I I believe I see that, and and I and I'm speaking that into the universe. So I'm I'm seeing that to be true in in the next five years. Um, in the next three years, all most if not all medical schools will have to be educating their doctors on the endocannabinoid system, so that the guys that guys and girls, sorry, that graduate you know, by 2005, 2000, you know, or five, six years from now, we'll have some understanding and knowledge of the endocannabinoid system. So I believe by three, within three years, there's going to be enough of an influx because powerful people are getting involved. People that we trust, such as you, that came into our living rooms daily for years, you know, that we created, even though we didn't know you personally, we felt as though we did know you, you know, I, I heard uh, Mike Tyson do an interview, you know, on a Tony Robbins podcast, and he's getting into the cannabinoid industry, promoting and producing CBD as well. So more and more people are getting involved, more and more celebrities are getting involved, and that's going to trickle down into mainstream society to where it's going to make it into the medical schools. And, and because, you know, it, the consumers are going to demand it, like you said. And so it's going to get to that point where the school, the schools are going to be educating the physicians, and this will be part of the curriculum. And then in a year from now, I think we're still going to be dealing with the aftermath of COVID-19. Wow. Okay. Well, sir, I can't say thank you enough for being here. And you always have a home here. Let's be blunt with Montel whenever you want to come back. And we definitely want to have you come back again. I mean, it's been a really, really, really good conversation. And I'm hoping that, you know, again, I'm a, I'm a Floridian also, so I'm down here. So I'll reach out to you and see if there's ever a time that you and I could uh, spend some time on stage together down the road. We should do so. I would sure. love to. I would truly love to because back in the day when I did watch your shows and, and watch how emotional you would get and everything, I always thought in the back of my mind, I think that guy could be a good friend of mine. Without a doubt, I think you could too. Be a very good friend of mine. Well, I'm going to let you all know out there, he's definitely a friend of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. And thank you all for tuning in today. It's Dr. Joseph Rosado, who's been our guest, who's really a phenomenal, I think, just a mover and shaker and leader in this business. Go ahead and hold that book up, sir. Hold it up. Hold it up. Stick it right in front of the camera. I can hold it up in my native tongue because English was my second language. Esperanza y Sanación. For, those, for our family members that do not read English, it is available in Spanish. And there it is in English. Hope and Healing, A Case for Cannabis. It's again by Dr. Joseph Rosado. Make sure you go out and get a copy of that book. On Amazon, Kindle, Barnes & Noble. Perfect. And if anybody wants to reach out to you directly or reach out to get any information from your 
a coastal cannabis company clinics, what do they do? Where do they go? They can go to my website, which is very easy, josephrosadomd.com, josephrosadomd.com. And if you want to shoot me an email, it's info at josephrosadomd.com, info at josephrosadomd.com. Okay, I'm hoping everybody copy that down and make sure you reach out to Dr. Joseph whenever you need to. If you need some extra information, I'm going to say thank you so much for tuning in today. For this edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel, make sure you tune into the next one.